Tonight's episode of Legacy Battle is sponsored by the Thrive Experience by Level. Thrive Experience is a premium daily lifestyle plan to help folks reach physical and mental levels. Contact my friend Uncle Troy at UncleTroyTroy79.level, L-E-D-E-E-L.com. Get thriving in all areas of your life. Enjoy the show. Good evening. Welcome to Legacy Battle. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and join the Facebook group. If you're interested in sponsoring an episode, hit us up in the comments section. I am Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. Here with me tonight from the Gridiron Battle Zone, Brian King uh, from well, Steelers Nation South, Rollo Cawthon, and of course, Penn State Collegiate All-Star Kevin Adams. We are joined tonight by special guest. He was a star quarterback at Notre Dame where he was a two-time All-American. He won the Sammy Boff Award and a national championship. He also set the, the Notre Dame pass down, <laughs> excuse me, passing touchdown record. He was drafted by the Steelers, where he won two Super Bowls. And then his final year, he's picked up in the expansion draft by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Ladies and gentlemen, Terry Hanratty. Hey, guys. How are you? Nice to be there. Good, good. Thank you for joining us. As always, we're going to have a Q&A uh, with Terry about his career afterwards. Tonight's debate is the top five offensive Steelers of all time. So at the end, each of us will pick one, and that will form the top five list. And we're going to start tonight with Franco Harris. Franco Harris from my alma mater. We are Penn State. Let's do it. <laughs> so yeah, Franco. And you guys might recognize his statue when you come off an airplane uh, at Pittsburgh International and you're leaving the uh, terminal. Uh, his famous immaculate reception statue is right there as you walk in uh, to exit the airport. But uh, so, yeah, he's pulled back to the Steelers uh, for most of his career. He did play one season with Seattle Seahawks. Um, you know, he actually went to Seattle because uh, he was closing in on Walter Payton's uh, record. Um, and... Uh, or I'm sorry, Jim Brown's uh, record, uh, and Walter Payton was too, and he asked for a raise. Um, and the Rooneys thought he was on a decline, so they didn't offer it him, uh, and they actually released him. That's how he ended up in Seattle for one year. But uh, So he graduated from Penn State, um, selected by the Steelers, uh, first round in 1972 uh, at the NFL draft. He was the 13th overall pick uh, that year. Uh, played his first 12 years in, in Pittsburgh and one year with uh, Seattle, like I had mentioned. Uh, he was inducted into the Ho Football Hall of Fame, uh, in 1990, uh, while playing for Penn State, um, he was mainly a blocker, actually. Uh, he blocked for the All-American running back, Lydell Mitchell. Um, but he did still accumulate, you know, a little over 2,000 yards uh, rushing with 24 touchdowns. He averaged over five yards per carry in college. Um, he, he pulled in 28 passes for 352 yards uh, receiving and another touchdown. He also led the, the team in scoring in 1970 for Penn State. Um, in his first season with the Steelers, it was 1972. Uh, he was named the league's rookie of the year by both the Sporting News and the United Press International. Um, he rushed for uh, a little over 1,000 yards on 188 carries, and he averaged 5.6 yards per carry. Um, he also rushed for 10 touchdowns and caught four touchdown passes that year. Uh, his fans, actually, uh, in Pittsburgh, they kind of dubbed themselves Franco's Italian Army um, and wore army helmets with his number on them. Um, because, you know, rookie year coming out and putting up numbers like that, you know, impressed. Definitely good numbers for a rookie. Um, uh, he actually was chosen for nine consecutive Pro Bowls starting his rookie year, 72 uh, through 1980, and he was an All-Pro in 1977. <clears throat> he rushed for more than 1,000 yards in eight seasons, breaking the record set by the great Jim Brown. Uh, and we had talked about Jim Brown in a previous debate. Um, though Harris retired, um, he, when he retired, he fell short of Jim Brown's rushing yard record by 192 yards, unfortunately. 
Um, that last season, he only played eight games in Seattle and only got 170 yards that season. So he ended up falling short of Jim Brown's record. Um, but uh, in 1975, he was the most valuable player of the Super Bowl, uh, Super Bowl nine. Uh, in that game, he rushed for 158 yards and a touchdown. Uh, he was the first African-American as well as first Italian-American to actually be named Super Bowl MVP. Uh, so that's quite a feat there. Uh, he was third all time in rushing at the time uh, when he actually retired. Uh, he had over 12,000 yards rushing and averaged over four yards per carry. He had 91 rushing touchdowns total, another uh, 2,200 plus yards receiving, nine more receiving touchdowns. So to recap, he's a four-time Super Bowl champ, Super Bowl MVP, nine-time Pro Bowler, first team All-Pro in 77, two-time second All-Team Pro in 72-75, NFL Man of the Year in 76, NFL Rookie of the Year in 72, NFL Rushing Touchdown Leader in 76, 1970s All-Decade Team, and a Steelers All-Time Team, 15th All-Time Rushing Leader, 11th all-time rushing TDs tied with uh, Jerome Bettis, who Brian's going to be representing. Now, Bettis did have a few more yards than than Franco, but Franco had more Pro Bowls, uh, more Super Bowl victories, and you can't forget the immaculate reception. 1972 playoff game against the Raiders with 22 seconds left. He snagged that deflected pass down by his toes before it hit the ground and took it to the house to win the game. Um, Franco Harris is top-notch, Hall of Famer, one of the best running backs to play the game. And you gotta represent Go Steelers. Well, upside down. Upside down. <laughs> <laughs> now who did who did Chuck Noel when they drafted Franco? Who did Chuck Noel want? I don't know. Good question. Don't know. Anybody know that answer? I don't know. know. There was a battle in the you know, at that time Chuck hadn't won much. Right. Or barely at all. Right. So, the, the, you know, they had that blesto that Bears and Lions and I think it was all the teams mixed together. And Chuck desperately wanted Robert Newhouse. Oh, yeah. He, he was a guy. Yes. Yeah. And the scouting team in Pittsburgh talked him into – basically, Chuck didn't have the power then. Five years later, Chuck calls all the plays after a couple of Super Bowls, obviously. But the, the scouting system said, no, we're taking Franco out of Penn State. And Chuck said, okay. But right initially, he Robert Newhouse. It's quite a combo with uh, Franco and, and Rocky Blyer there for quite a while. I mean, was, Terry, you play with Franco. What, what's your impressions of him? Franco took a lot of heat. You know, it was a t totally different game back then. I mean, Franco was a great running back. There's no doubt. But he took criticism for running out of bounds occasionally. And he would always, if Franco needed five yards and he's only going to get one, he's going to step out of bounds. If he needed one yard, he's going to go for it. Franco was smart. You know, he didn't take that extra beating that he didn't need to take because we're going to need him later. And people don't understand how good a hands he had. Because you know, back then, you know, if you threw the ball 20, 22 times a game, that was quite a bit. So Franco didn't have that many opportunities to catch the ball. When he did, he caught the ball. And one of the greatest catches ever was the back of the reception. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, Franco, and he's still in the Pittsburgh area. So, um, you know, keeping his name vibrant there in the Pittsburgh area. Um, so let's go to Jerome Bettis. All right, the bus. Well, um, yeah, Jerome Bettis, you know, he uh, he went to, uh, you know, Terry Hanrad, his alma mater at Notre Dame. Um, he came out in 1993. This guy was, he was five foot eleven, two hundred fifty five pounds. So he was a load to bring down. Uh, Nineteen ninety three with the Rams, he gets the uh, the Rookie of the Year. He spends three seasons there. Um, he ends up uh, total for his uh, career, he gets six Pro Bowls, three All Pro selections. So nineteen ninety six, he joins the Steelers via trade. One of the most lopsided trades, and really in the history of the NFL, uh, the Rams basically got nothing out of the trade. Uh, we get a Hall of Famer. Um, and he had he had had a rough '95 season. Well, '96 he I mean he just him and the, and the Steelers was just a match made in heaven. And he gets comeback player of the year. Has a great 1996 season. Um, goes on to have a thousand yards in eight seasons, over seven touchdowns in nine seasons. He has 62 100 yard games, and in those 100 yard games, um, whoever his team was, the Rams or the Steelers, was 45 and 17. So if he got over 100, there was a 
very darn good chance that, that his team was going to win. Uh, he ended up eighth place all time uh, on the rushing uh, on the rushing list with uh, 13,662 yards, fifth place all time in carries uh, with almost 3,500, um, tenth all time in rushing touchdowns with 91. Uh, the one comparison between Bettis and, and Franco that we can draw is Franco had a real problem with, with fumbles um, in comparison with, uh, with Bettis. Now, Bettis's fumbles per attempt was only 1.2%, while Franco was up at 3.1%. Uh, but, you know, and, and the bus was really, you know, was a great nickname for, the, for Bettis. It really, like, you know, kind of defined what he was. But I think a little bit better of a nickname was the one that Bill Cower gave him. And that was the closer, because we saw so many times during his career when the Steelers would get a lead and be in the fourth quarter, and they need to grind clock, they needed to to get first down, string some you know string a drive together, and and just basically you know take the will away from the uh, opposition's defense. And that's what Bettis was, Bettis was all about. Um, you know, a closer in in baseball is you know he's the pitcher that comes in you know in, in the late innings to, to, to kind of close out the game and get the win. He's like the fresher the fresher guy, the guy that's you know he's gonna you know sort of impose his will on you know on the batters in the late part of the game. And that's what Bettis was, you know, for the for as a running back in the game of football. I mean, this guy was he would just wear the defenses down. They'd be tired and they would lose the will to want to tackle him. Uh, that was that was something that was incredible about him. He did not he did not shy away from uh, from contact. He in fact he enjoyed it, and so he was just a sledgehammer, just boom 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 over and over again, and and eventually the walls would come down. Uh, I feel like he was just such a great weapon for the Steelers because you know during the time of his career he was really he was the offense. Terry, what are your thoughts Kevin, on the I see bus? Kevin over there. He has a stiff neck from shaking it like this the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he, he, he says that we can draw the one comparison, but, you know, he's failing to mention that Bettis averaged less than four yards per carry. Bettis was not even really a contributor in the Super Bowl win that he was a part of. Um, he actually almost cost the Steelers from going to the Super Bowl that year when he fumbled against the Colts. And thank goodness, Roethlisberger – who we're going to discuss later, thankfully, because he's a good quarterback, made the, the game-saving tackle to save Jerome Bettis' behind. Um, and, you know, Franco had, like I said, more Pro Bowls, more, more Super Bowl victories, more receiving yards and receiving touchdowns. I think Franco Harris, hands down, is a better running back all around than, than he Jerome Bettis. He's got triple the fumbles, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was more successful. I love it. You guys are splitting hairs between Hall of Fame running backs. <laughs> I think, we're we're trying to get our I think this is going to be a big part of the uh, process here this evening. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all part of the fun. What, what were your thoughts on Jerome Bettis, Terry? Well, Jerome, obviously, from Notre Dame, which I loved. And Jerome, is, he was the ramrod. I mean, he was, you know, he was going to get that. You know, Franco was... Franco is more of a cross between a, a tailback and a fullback. Franco had those moves to the outside where Jerome was just in between the tackles. Every case, he would bounce to the outside. But, uh, you know, Franco, you know, it's tough to tough to uh, take it away from Franco because, I mean, he had four Super Bowls. And he may even had more. Did you just have four? I'm not sure whether four. he was there. Four, four yeah. yeah. And, you know, it, it all comes down to that. I mean, you have two great backs, so you have to get that, that hair you got to split. And they probably would have to lean up towards Franco, even though was, I hate to go against another name guy. But look at that pencil. Look at that nitty line over there. Just <laughs> get your cat. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move to uh, Ben Roethlisberger. Who's You're on taking mute, Rallo. What you can go. I say about what can I say about Big Ben? Big Ben comes in as the rookie, eleventh uh, round. I mean, eleventh pick, first round. Uh, when he was coming out, comes out of the University of Miami, Ohio, and he was talked about being a top five pick. And luckily, he slid to the Steelers at eleven because we've had, we've had nothing but success since he's been under center. Comes in, goes fourteen and one as a rookie. Um, you know, loses in the uh, AFC title game. His, his career just took off from there. Um, you know, he broke a 
ton of rookie records um, his first year, you know, highest passer rating, um, most wins as a rookie. So he came in, you know, in success, but you know, he's sort of kind of a game manager. And as he went on, his game evolved. I mean, it really did evolve. I mean, he's led the league in passing yards, you know, from later in his career this year, he threw uh, 33 touchdowns, 10 interceptions. Uh, this is coming off of elbow surgery, serious major elbow surgery. Um, you know, he's led the team to three Super Bowls, two Super Bowl wins. Um, you know, he, he's, he ranks eighth all time in passing touchdowns. I mean, passing yards. So he's going to wind up probably top six, maybe top five before his career is over. And this is despite being a game, a game manager early in his career where the team ran a lot with Bettis and Willie Parker and those, and those boys. Uh, he's top 10 in passing touchdowns. He's passed top 10 in passing yards. I mean, what can you say about the guy who's led this team for, for since he's walked in the door? Uh, he, he waited, what, one game before he, before he took over the range after Mattis got hurt. So he's, he's been the consummate professional later in his career. Um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, I remember one time uh, early in, the, in his career that the Roonies were talking about trading him because uh, he was such a bad influence and he was having a lot of off-the-field issues, but he cleaned it up, buttoned it down, and became a great future Hall of Fame quarterback. Terry, what do you what do you think about uh, what's going on with Ben now and the Steelers keeping him for another year? Do you, do you feel it was time for him to, to maybe move on or? Yeah, you know, he you... showed last year that you know he has great accuracy for about twelve yards, and you know when you when you see the defense and they're settling at fifteen and reacting up, you know they're not really they're not really pushing it downfield, and I think it's I think it's that time you know New England went went the same route with uh, Brady. You know, they got rid of Brady because you know they had the, eventually the salary cap catches up to everybody, yeah. and Brady is different because he takes so good care of his body. And these quarterbacks, you know, Ben took a lot of again give it to Ben where he took a lot of hits, a lot of punishment in, in his career, which other quarterbacks didn't. I mean, they had Brady. You know, he still they still haven't had to wash his uniform after a game. <laughs> the guy just never gets hit. And he could. I don't think these guys could have played in the '70s or '80s when quarterbacks were actually had contact. You know, every game. You, if you slid back in the day, you had three helmets in you, and it was legal. You know, nowadays you can't even touch the quarterback, so you can. It's like playing seven on seven for that position. You can sit back there and it's all shotgun. You don't even have to drop back. Just you know, pick everybody apart. But I mean, Brady's a great quarterback for for this for this time. But Ben, you know, I think you know he's 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 made the difference. I mean, he's been a great quarterback for the Steelers. Uh, you know, they, I think they got. But you have to, you know, and I'm sure you're going to make the obviously the best question is going to be the comparison with Terry. And you know, you got to realize that when when we came into the league, the Steelers were awful. When Ben came into the league, he had a great defense and he had a great running game, so it's a lot easier for him. You know, we came in and we didn't have, you know, the whole team my rookie, rookie year in '69. Probably half the team was gone by '71, and Chuck just kept getting rid of guys, getting rid of guys, and putting putting guys into position that uh, to build the team that he, that he thought and which he was true with. But uh, I, you, I don't think you can really make the comparison. I think uh, you know Ben. I think this year, I really think he should think about serious about giving it up. There's no reason for him to continue to play, and I think he owes it to the Steelers to find out if the backup can play. And I like the kid. I forget his name now. Mason Rudolph. Mason, Mason Rudolph. Yeah, Mason Rudolph. <clears throat> I liked him. You know, he was forced when Ben got hurt. And I don't think he was quite ready to play then. But he's when he's gotten in since then, he's done very well. And he's got a big arm. And he's mobile. So I think it's time to make the change and put Rudolph in there and let him go. Let him go for it and see what happens. Because, you know, now with 18 free agents, that team is going to be so different from what it was last year. I mean, Pouncey's gone. Ben's on the edge. They say that the receiver from Southern Cal, you know, he's, they can't afford to keep him. Who are, they gonna, who are they gonna pay? I mean, they already got a lot of commitments out there and, you know, they gotta come under the salary cap. So it's gonna be, it's a good, it's a good transition time. I mean, right now, if you look at that division, you'd have to say Pittsburgh's number four because the other three teams have already gone through that transition. So they're right. very young. The Steelers are transitioning. 
know, they're very old right now. They're getting rid of a lot of older guys. So, I mean, everybody has to go through it. It's a fact of life. You know, you can't, Brady's the only one who's been able to beat Mother Nature. <laughs> and, uh, you know, no, no one else has. So I think, I think it's time for Ben to hang it up and uh, let Rudolph get in. Because this is Rudolph's last year of his contract. Do you pay right. him if you don't see him play? That's a hard call for the Roonies to make. Because if you have Ben to play another year, now you got Rudolph. You could possibly have no quarterbacks by the by the end of next year. Ben could be done, and Rudolph is could be gone. You don't know. I mean, he could, he's a free agent. So right, I think right. it's a good time to find out can this kid play or not for him. Give him a whole season and go and go for it. Good, Ron. I did want to add that <clears throat> the Steelers have a small championship window right now with a def their defense, I should say. You know, with with uh, Watts and Bush coming off comeback from injury, you got Fitz Mika, you have Joe and Steven on the outside. Uh, they still have, you know, Cam Hayward, you know, success to it. They still have a very strong defense. And I don't think the Roonies want to lose that opportunity by throwing Mason in there, being unknown and unproven for 16 games versus a proven Ben who has done it. Uh, that's why they went out. They got rid of Feetner simply because he wasn't calling plays that were, were beneficial to the team. There, there were portions of the field that, that we weren't throwing to. They weren't making making calls like in the middle of the field. Everything all been. I, I saw a stat where, where of, of 38 of Ben's uh, deep passes, 32 of them were just straight shots by Claypool and, and Washington. There was no there was no uh, creativity in the play calling. And so bringing in Matt Canada, who is a very creative offensive mind, and they, they plan on, based off of what Rooney and Colbert have said, to fixing the running game and getting the running game back going, that's only going to benefit the Steelers by having a single caller under center who understands uh, protections and, and line calls and, and audibles versus Mason, who really hasn't really done any of that in game situations. And so... <clears throat> The window, I think the Roonies believe that the window is still there. Uh, I believe, because I'm a Steeler fan, I believe the window is still there, especially with the defense. We get some, some, you know, a couple guys on the offensive line, maybe draft a running back who can help out the offensive line. I think we're right back in the picture. You have to solidify the offensive line. Losing Pouncey is, is huge. And, Absolutely. And, there's, and if you saw any problem with the Steelers last year, the biggest problem, the biggest problem with any team that doesn't have success, you can – or – they have success is the offensive line. I mean, we talked a lot about Bettis. We talked a lot about Franco. We talked, we're talking about Ben now. We're going to be talking about Bradshaw. But look at the line. That's the key. That's the key to football. I mean, everybody sort of gets complicated. They, they want to draft the quarterback, the pretty boy, but they have no offensive line. Why do you need him? You got to build from within. Steelers, when I was Joe Green, everybody went crazy in Pittsburgh. You guys are too young to remember. Everybody went crazy. Who is this guy, Joe Green? Well, now they know. Then you you build either you build the defensive line or offensive line first. Take your pick. And now the Steelers, I granted, they have a good defense and they got guys coming back. But can they move the ball? That's the key. They don't have, you know, Connors is a good back, but he's not a breakaway back. He doesn't scare any defenses. So you you know you really. You know, you got to be careful here. I mean, it's a fine line, and it's uh, and you and he, again, if you if you get a running back and you have no offensive line, why do you have a running back? You get, get that bad pick, right? That it's going to be that guard or that tackle that no one has any clue that he's going to be in there for for uh, twelve years in that position. And that's where you got to build from inside out, both sides of the ball. Well, let's move on to uh, Terry Bradshaw. And I got him. So Terry, number one pick, first player from a small school to be picked number one overall. You know, that's something really special that's always going to be in the record book for him. Um, you know, my I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, you know, Terry has the stats that Ben Roethlisberger has. It's a different game. Um, so comparing stats would be kind of ridiculous. But – the stats that are important to tell are four Super Bowls for Terry Bradshaw and only two Super Bowl wins for, for Roethlisberger. And, um, 
you know, Bradshaw had eight AFC Central championships, which is that's a lot. That's that's good. Um, you know, like I was saying, it's different times. They didn't throw the ball around as much, but you know, Bradshaw's a two-time Super Bowl MVP, NFL MVP, first team all pro, second team all pro, two-time touchdown passing leader. He's on the all decade team. Um He's been in the Pro Bowl three times. Now, granted, Ben had six, so Ben does beat him on that. Um, but he's also a Sports Illustrated Man of the Year. And, of course, he's in the Hall of Fame. You know, everybody we're talking about today is going to be in it's the Hall of Fame at some point if they're not already in. Um, you know, and, and Terry, when he played, you know, he dealt with – he struggled with depression and anxiety. He's able to, to play through a lot of that and, and still be a high-caliber quarterback. But if i got to compare him to Ben – I, I, I'm going to, I'm just going to say this is being the first team all pro and the second team all pro tells you that you're the best quarterback in the league or the second best quarterback of your second team all. And Ben doesn't have those. So Ben was never the best quarterback in the league during his tenure so far, whereas Bradshaw was at one point the best quarterback in the league. So and then, of course, we all know he's on Fox now and, and the movies, Cannonball Run, Smokey and the Bandit 2, Failure to Launch. You know, if you if you want to see Bradshaw's rear end, then watch Failure to Launch. No um, thanks. That's yeah. with McConaughey, right? <laughs> yeah, with McConaughey. <laughs> and then, of course, um, he's got the show with his whole family now, the Bradshaw Bunch on uh, E! Network or whatever that is. So, you know, he's definitely still stayed relevant all these years later. Um, but... You know, for a time there, he was the best quarterback, and we can't we can't say that about Ben. He was never the best quarterback during his tenure. So. Ben also played during the the Brady Manning, Breeze, Rogers, Favre era, where I mean, it was much harder to garner all pros. Uh, with those yes, guys, Starbuck, <laughs> Tarkington. Um, I don't know if Jack Kemp was back then. There was a lot of good quarterbacks. Yeah, there were there were good quarterbacks in in all eras. It, it's just it, you can't compare one to the other, one era to the other. I mean, it's it's totally different ball game. I mean, Ben's probably the best comparison there is to the '70s and the '80s because he took so much punishment, you know, self inflicted because he held onto the ball so long, and it, we, it was very successful in doing that. But still, you're going to take a good beating. But back then, I mean, it, it was it was a totally different ball game, and we only played 14 games and. Uh, I know you're talking about running backs earlier. We've got to get in before I forget, but Jim Brown only played 12 games a year. And there's still no one as great as him. No matter who we mention tonight, Jim's still number one. But uh, with, uh, with Terry, I think he's the most underrated quarterback ever. I think he really, you know, we, again, what I mentioned earlier, when we came into the league, you know, I was 69, he was 70. We were, Steelers were awful. I mean, we were 1-13 my rookie year. I think we won four games, four games uh, my second year or something like that. And, and it was, you know, it was really a, a horrible show until, but Chuck, you know, built the confidence that everybody just had to hang in there. You know, he's, he's weeding out the guys he doesn't want and bringing in the guys he, that he's going to win with. And so, but, but uh, and I, you know, you can also make the comparison with Noel and you got Cower and Tomlin. Noel built the, the foundation. And Cowher and Tomlin went along with it with the strong running game and the, and the great defense. And the same thing with Bradshaw. You know, the, the, the quarterbacks built the, built the whole thing along the way. You know, but, but it was all Noel. It was all Noel's because Noel was basically the offensive coordinator, the defensive coordinator, and the head coach. You know, they, and they had other guys, but Chuck sort of ran everything. And, uh, but, uh, you know, Terry, he just never really got the credit because you know, everything was all defense back then, which is true. We had a great defense. I mean, it was wild. In in the Super Bowl nine, I think. Uh, well, the Raiders in the playoffs, we helped them to something like fifty four total yards. Then I think the the that, or Minnesota had like nineteen total yards. Anybody know the score at the halftime of that Super Bowl nine? Was it six nothing or? Yeah, it's it was, it was yeah, about say. seven nothing. Two nothing. Two nothing. That's right. Yeah, there was. was I think I think Dwight got the uh, safety. Right Dwight White. Yeah, I, so. I think he was the leading scorer going into the locker room. <laughs> Defensive end. Wow. But, uh, no, I mean, it, again, it's it's very difficult 
when you're trying to compare Hall of Famers because there's just that, that fine hair that you have to split. It, but the, the only bad part about it, they were all different eras. You know, so uh, what's that book you're holding up there for me to read? This ticket here is a reminder of Roethlisberger's 522-yard, six-touchdown game, and only player to throw two consecutive games of six touchdowns in two consecutive games. Good. You never saw Bradshaw throw. How many Super Bowls you got? How many Super Bowls you got? Exactly. Uh, yeah, but you can say that the, the defense back then was uh, <laughs> the main contributor to that. Well, well you're just making a thing now. Oh, okay. just, Robert just made the point that they still have a great defense, so they better keep them. In 2005, <laughs> Paul Amalu didn't have a great defense. Yeah, always, even defense. back in the day when the Steelers got beat by everybody with the score, the team who played the Pittsburgh, they limped out of there. They beat Pittsburgh on the scoreboard, but they were going to get their ass kicked no matter what. <laughs> So we've always had the defense. All right, let's move to the wide receivers. Uh, we'll start with John Stallworth. Ooh, All right, John Stallworth out of Alabama A&M. Um, he was discovered by Bill Nunn, who, who's recently put into the Hall of Fame, the great scout. Um, you know, one of these guys that was from, you know, Southern Black College uh, that was largely ignored before that. Uh, so he comes in, he gets uh, three Pro Bowls during his career, two All-Pros, um, he really stepped up in big moments. Uh, Super Bowl 13, he caught a 75-yard touchdown pass, which put the Steelers ahead of the Cowboys. Ultimately, ultimately ended up with 115 uh, yards, two touchdowns in that Super Bowl. Uh, Super Bowl 14, he caught a beautiful over-the-shoulder 73-yard pass from Bradshaw that put the, the Steelers up for good over the Rams. Um that one, he ended up uh, having 121 yards in, in that Super Bowl. And he probably could have been named the MVP. They, they went with Bradshaw instead, but it probably could have been Stallworth. Uh, he set a Super Bowl record for, for average uh, uh, yards per catch, which still stands. Um, and he has an NFL playoff record for scoring a touchdown in eight consecutive playoff games. Uh, now, 1984, this is after the Super Bowl years, he had sort of a – he had 83, he had an injury. In 84, he actually had his best season. He, he was comeback player of the year, and he had almost 1,400 yards in that season. So just a really great year for him there. Uh, I just feel like with with Stallworth, he was kind of overshadowed at times by Swan and, and some of the other stars on the team. But when he finally got his opportunities, he really shined. So we'll be talking about Heinz Ward in a minute here, but – Terry, I mean, you, you guys, do you guys know the story about because Swan and Stallworth came in the same year? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, if I you understand know, right, the they draft? were originally doing the draft. They were uh, Noel originally wanted to draft Stallworth number one, right? And no. then, but they made him wait. The Rooney's made him wait. Well, what they had is that you know again that Blesto. It was what Blesto was Bears, B L Lions, Eagles, Steelers, and I figure what they are. But other ones, there were about five of them. And and the, the Blesto had Stallworth at 4'9 uh, in the 40. And the Steelers had him at 4'5. Right, right. Well, here you got Stallworth from small school. You got Swan, the All-American from Southern California, right, the golden boy. He said, well, if we take Stallworth, someone else is going to get. And I, I'll never forget this. Chuck was almost, he was giddy. We, we had a workout, and he came into the locker room after the workout, before the season, the spring, you know, one of those mini camps. And, you know, both Stallworth and Swan were there. And, he, and he's telling me that he sits, you know, at the first locker, number five, right? And he came in, and he said, what do you think of those two guys? What do you think about them? And he told me the whole story about how they were going to take Stallworth number one. And they figured, well, we got a shot of getting both of them if we take Swan and no one, everybody thinks this guy's a 4 9, which is absolutely crazy. And so they got, I think, Stall in the fourth round, third or fourth, I forget about fourth. Yeah. But, uh, but those two guys are, I get, I'm, am I jumping ahead here? I don't know what. No, no, no. No, you're good. You're good. He and, he and Swan were such compliments to each other. You know, before that, we had two great receivers in Ron Shanklin and Frank Lewis. You know, Eddie Robinson, who's one of the great coaches of all time, said that Frank Lewis is the greatest athlete he's ever had at Grambling. And that's wow. back when Grambling was putting more guys into the pros than anybody. So Frank, you know, he just, 
he was such a racehorse. I mean, his legs were just ripped and he was, the whole body was just ripped and he just couldn't stay healthy. His hamstrings and Chuck did him a favor and traded him to Buffalo where it's a little breezy up there that's good for the muscles. But then, you know, then Swan and Stallworth came, came along. And, uh, you know, Swan was the guy, he was the ballerina. He was the guy who was going to jump four feet in the air, catch the ball and juggle it and whatnot. Stallworth is the, is the true Pittsburgh receiver because you could throw the ball in the dirt and Stallworth's going to get, get down there and get it out of there for you. He was just a you know, blue collar. Worker and, and we were fortunate to have both at the same time. They're great, both great talents. Well, let's uh, move on to Heinz Ward. <clears throat> Heinz Ward, one of my favorite Steelers. Um, I actually uh, ate at his restaurant that's in Cran- though it was in Cranberry. If I'm not mistaken, it's closed now. Um, but great, great wide receiver out of the University of Georgia, drafted by the Steelers in the third round, the 1998. NFL draft. Uh, I, I consider that a steal, getting him in the third round. Uh, he played his entire professional career with the Steelers, uh, and he became the team's all-time leader in receptions, receiving yardage, and touchdown receptions. Um, Ward was voted MVP of uh, the Super Bowl against Seattle, and upon his retirement, he is one of 11 NFL players that have uh, at least 1,000 career receptions. Um, he's currently still coaching the NFL, um, and the last I heard, uh, I think it was Detroit that, that might be picking him up uh, for wide receivers coach um, uh, here shortly. Um, but he attended uh, actually uh, Forest Park High School in Georgia, and he was actually a quarterback uh, in high school. And he was a two-time Clayton County Offensive Player of the Year uh, in high school. Um, he also played baseball. I actually didn't know that about him, which uh, researched him found that out. And he actually was drafted by the Florida Marlins. Uh, he was a 73rd round pick of the 1994 MLB draft. Um, but when he came out of college, uh, he actually, uh, w- it was discovered he was missing an ACL in his left knee. Uh, he played his whole career missing, uh, in, in ACL. Uh, he had lost it in a, like a, I believe it was a bicycle accident, uh, in his childhood. Um, and actually, um, he was considered one of the top five receivers of the 98 draft with Kevin Dyson and Randy Moss at that point. But when people found out he was missing that ACL, his value dropped. Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Indianapolis Colts had expressed a lot of interest in him. When they heard that he was missing an ACL, they, they passed on him. Uh, and then, you know, the Steelers picked him up in the third round. You know, Ward is one of the most versatile, best hands, willingness to block uh, defenders um, for, you know, the running backs and everything. Um, he earned three team most valuable player selections. He was also a four-time Pro Bowl selection. Uh, he had a streak of four consecutive 1,000-yard seasons, uh, and that end, it ended in 2005, though, because he had an injury uh, and missed one game, or else he probably would have had 1,000 yards that year, too. Um, he set Steelers franchise records for receptions, touchdowns, uh, but they have both since been broken by uh, Antonio Brown. Um, but he, uh, he was named to first of two consecutive all-NFL teams. Um, you all know he's considered one of the best blocking receivers in, in the NFL, um, but he also faced a lot of criticism because of his blocking and his style of blocking. A lot of people said he would, you know, cheap shot, you know, give you a blind block. Um, he couldn't and, play today. <laughs> what's up? He couldn't <laughs> play today. <'cause laughs> he hit too hard. True. Our whole um, defense back then couldn't play today because it hit too hard. <laughs> yep. So I, the NFL actually coined uh, a, a new role called the Heinz Ward role, which made a blindside block illegal if the block came from the, the blocker's helmet, forearm, or shoulder and landed to the head or neck area of the defender. Um, and he was actually voted the dirtiest player in the NFL <laughs> in 2009 in a poll that was done with players that year. Um, but to recap, I mean, he finished his career with 1,000 receptions, over 12,000 yards receiving. He averaged over 12 yards per reception. He had 85 touchdowns, ranking him 26 uh, all-time in receiving yards all-time, 16th all-time in receiving touchdowns. 14th in receptions. He's a two-time Super Bowl champion, Super Bowl MVP in 2006. He became the first Korean American to win the Super Bowl MVP award. Um, and in September 2010, President Barack Obama actually appointed him as a member of the President's Advisory Commission for Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Um, he's a four-time Pro Bowl, I said, three-time second all-team All-Pro, Steelers all-time team, first team All-SEC, uh, second team All-SEC. 
He won the Outback Bowl, which actually, if I'm not mistaken, he was a quarterback uh, when that happened. Um, Yeah, for Georgia. Um, And he actually had set records in that bowl game um, for, like, passing yards and touchdown passes for Georgia. Um, He also won the 12th season of Dancing with the Stars. I seem to always get the athletes with the the Stars. (laughs) So he's got a mirror ball trophy. Come on, none of y'all players have that. (laughs) And then he was also, uh, to end it, he was an honorary ambassador in the 2018 Winter Olympics that were in South Korea. Um, So he's got the accolades on and off uh, the field. He's got the stats. He's a Hall of Famer, one of the best wide receivers. He set the Steelers records um, at the time when, uh, when he was playing. Great guy, great wide receiver. Is he in the Hall of Fame now? Not yet, no. Not oh, yet. I'm sorry, no. No, I'm sorry, he's not in the Hall of Fame yet. He should be. He should be. I, I agree. He has the and I'll tell you what, he, he was the greatest blocking wide receiver I've ever seen. You know, I don't care what they say about cheap shots, but, you know, it's a contact sport. And that helps the running game so much when you get that wide receiver out there to get take the support guy out. That's where Rocky was so valuable with Franco. Because Rocky was a great blocking back. I mean, he hit either the linebacker or the defensive end and enabled Franco to, you know, make that first step around everybody. Yeah, so Hines, one. he's been on five years now on the Hall of Fame ballot, right? Five years? Yeah, he, yeah. He hasn't been a finalist yet either, which is surprising. Yeah, let me say one thing real quick about Hines. I mean, how many times did we see him make the really tough third down catch in traffic, just get leveled? And he'd stand up, and he had that signature, you know, yeah, ear to ear grin, that you know, yeah. and just kind of showing his opponent, like, yeah, you can't hurt me, you know. And yeah. I feel like that was such an intimidation factor. Yeah, Heinz was great. All right, let's move on to uh, Mike Webster. So Mike Webster, he was known as Iron Mike, and this was before Iron Mike Tyson was around. So the Iron Mike originated with Mike Webster, number fifty-three there, but. Um, Another four-time Super Bowl winner. You know, Super Bowls are important, obviously, so we got to bring that up. Of course, he's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, nine-time Pro Bowler, seven-time first-team All-Pro. He's on the NFL's 100th anniversary team. He's considered the greatest center of all time that, that ever played the game. Um, and he actually mentored the, the center we're going to talk about next, Dermonte Dawson. So Webster, uh, you know, mentored Dawson when he came in a league. And um, other than Ben Roethlisberger, Webster has played more seasons for the Steelers than any other player. Um, and he's ranked number 75 on Sporting News' 100 Greatest Players. Um, and that's really good because, you know, offensive linemen, defensive linemen, they don't get the play that is the QBs and the wide receivers and the running backs get. You know, their names aren't as huge. So just to make a list like that tells you how good he was at center. Um, you know, he was on the 70s and the 80s all-decade team. And uh, he recovered six fumbles in his career, which um, that's quite a few. So, um, sadly, you know, he died very young at 50 years old. You know, he had CTE. Um, anyone who's seen the movie Concussion, you know, knows a little bit about that. But, you know, his autopsy changed the world of football and has brought, you know, awareness that's going to save a lot of lives going forward, you know, in the future. So, but uh, Terry, I, I'm sure he blocked for you here and there, right? It was incredible. I mean, he came from the University of Wisconsin, and he was about 218 pounds when he showed up. And Mike was only about 5'11". May, I mean, you might be able to stretch him to six feet, you know, that, but that, I think that's a pull. <laughs> But I can remember when these guys used to go into the weight room. You know, Kolb was the leader. You know, John was the, you know, he was the, they were all over 500 with bench press. And Larry Brown, you know, Larry was 6'5". And he had these big, long arms. You know, I'd go in there, you know, of course, I'm not, you know, I just go in there to socialize. And I'd say, well, you know, we've got to get something going here because Larry, look, he's got to push that thing up to about three feet. And I said, Mike, you got to do it about a foot with those short little stubby arms you got there. And Cole was right in the middle of it, and uh, but it was it was interesting to watch these guys work out. I mean, because they were really gorillas in that in that weight room, and uh, but Webby was just you knew that once he was get in his game. I, I think he played guard for a couple games. I think then I mean we had a, Ray Mansfield was a great offensive guard, our center, 
I mean, he was really good, but Ray was on, you know, declining years. And Mike was, you know, they had to get him in the game. I mean, he was that strong and that that quick and what whatever. But then when he got in there and he got the strength, and I mean, he, you just could not move him. And it was interesting to watch in practice because back then, you know, they used to go live with Ernie Holmes and Mike Webster, you know, two guys that are just, you know, just all size and strength. And it was some, something to see. And, uh, but, you know, Webby was, you know, again, if, you, if, if you're not going to pick a quarterback, running back, or wide receiver, and if you want to pick an MVP, you probably pick him because he solidified that whole middle of the offensive line. And once you can't put pressure on the quarterback up the middle, it gives you a lot of a lot of leeway back there to, to relax and just throw the ball. Let's move on to our final player tonight, Dermani Dawson. So the great thing about the Steelers is that we've had, that I've known, great centers through my entire lifetime. So from Webster to Dirt Dawson to Pouncey, the legacy just lives on. But to me, when you have a guy who revolutionized the center position, so Dirt Dawson was one of the first centers to be consistent poor and get out in on the edge, lead blocking for the for the for the running game. That to me helps elevate him above Webster. Uh, he had more pro, more all pros than 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 Webby. Um, you know he didn't play on as, as much great teams. Uh, I think he did make it to one Super Bowl, but he revolutionized the center position. And you see it now in guys like Pouncey, you know, where he can get out of the edge and pull and be the lead blocker on screens and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, getting out and, you know, just being, being the lead blocker. Uh, Dirt was the, the first guy, you know, and he did it and he did it and he stayed healthy. He had 10 straight seasons of, of, of playing every game, especially at a position where, Guys fall on your legs. They roll up on you. You, can, you know, you get you get torn ACLs. You know, by somebody following you. So his athleticism to me puts him just a notch above Webby, simply because he did revolutionize the center position. Uh, and it, he did it, it. It just happened on a whim. They were in practice one day, and this, I I read about this. They were in practice, and the loft of the 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 office, the the guards. We're having a difficult time getting to the getting to the center or the, the second level, and uh, Dirt went to the, went to one of the coaches and said, "Hey, coach, I'm fast enough to do this," and that was one of the first times they tried it. Was in practice, was he pulled and he was they were able to get to the second line, and that's when things changed for the Steelers Steelers run game. I have that was the year that was the year that Barry Foster ran for the 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 the, the, the team record uh, 1600 plus yards. Dawson, Darmani was a great center, no doubt. But there's no way you'll ever get convince me. That's the only one you, that that I would go against everybody's tonight. That Webster was, he he was, he did so much, and he pulled too. I mean, Mike got outside, and Mike Mike did everything in the middle. I mean, he was, and you got to realize back then. I don't know what what it was back then, uh, but there was a lot of three four. So there was a guy over the center's nose a lot. So that was a constant pounding, pounding, pounding. They had to take care of him and help out. I mean, so there was a lot more, there was a lot of shifting around back there. I'm not, you know, it's too foggy to know what uh, Darmani did, but again, you're splitting hairs. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are all great. And is Dawson, is he in the Hall of Fame? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, oh, yes. Right, right. And, and, and rightfully so. But the Steelers going back to Ray Mansfield, Webby, Dawson, and Pouncey, I mean, that, I don't think you could find any team that had those kind of centers. And that tells you something right there, because those teams all ran the ball. And what they all had in common, they all had great centers. And just to combat what Rollo said, I got the Pro Bowls. I got Webster with nine and Dawson with seven. And then yeah. first team all pros, Webster with seven and Dermani with six. Six, yeah. So... But, uh, yeah, they're both great centers. And uh, you, like you said, I love how you said with the Steelers and the history of the centers there, Rollo. And uh, Jeff Hardings was in there for a while. That guy made he some, was some too, Pro yeah. Bowls. He was really good, too. They just they just know how to pick them. That's why I'm not too worried that Pouncey left. I feel like they're just going <laughs> to 
going to move on to the next Or you hope number. they keep going. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> all right, let's uh, – before we vote, here's tonight's trivia question for a prize. Prior winners, you guys are ineligible. Place your answers in the Facebook group comment section, um, and we'll get your prize mailed out to you if you get it right. So name all the players drafted in the NFL – that appeared in the movie Little Giants and the final score in the movie's final game. So hit that up on the Facebook page and we'll get your prize mailed out if you're the first one to get it all right. Okay, so let's move to our vote. We're going to start with uh, Kevin. You get first vote. Guys, remember, you can't pick your own player that you represented. So. Well, that's thanks, Scott. I think both of mine should be on here, just saying. Um, and I know the, I know the final, the name of the final play of Little Giants. Um, uh, but, uh, so I'm gonna have to, since I can't go with my own and I can't go like, with the players that are opposing mine, <laughs> I'm gonna have to go. <laughs> These Nittany <laughs> Lions, man, they, they'll never die. <laughs> <Always> right. <laughs> That's right. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with Mike Webster, uh, great center, great player. Um, and I think he did, uh, I think he did a lot for the Steelers, and, uh, and like you said, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the autopsy on him is going to help people in the future. Um, but he was a great player, and, and he, I think he had better uh, accolades, uh, if you will, uh, over Dawson. So uh, I'm going to have to go with Webster. I'll go next, despite the fact that I represented Terry Bradshaw and was trying to make the case that he's better than Ben. <laughs> I am wearing a Roethlisberger jersey right now. So wow. I'm taking Roethlisberger. I'll make it nice and easy. Um, wow, you guys are good. R Rollo, go ahead. <laughs> I'm going to have to go with my boy Bradshaw. Four <laughs> Super Bowl wins. Four Super Bowl wins. Uh, you know, NFL MVP, which Ben doesn't have, like you mentioned before. Uh, Super Bowl MVP, which Ben doesn't have, you know, uh, I got to go. I got to go with uh, with old Terry. <clears throat> okay, Brian. Wow, this is tough. Uh, you guys keep on taking the guy I was going to take. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good double uh, up. <laughs> yeah, so um, I, th I think I think really – I, I, I got to go with Dermody Dawson. Uh, I, I, I really respect the wow. way he revolutionized the, the center position. And, and he had, there was so much transition during his career. I mean, he started off under Chuck Noll, then he, then it was, then it was Bill Cower. There was, I mean, how many different quarterbacks were, were behind <laughs> Dermody Dawson during his career? And then none of them were really all that great, but he still carved out this Hall of Fame career. And he was just, uh, that running game went going no matter who the back was. So, uh, yeah, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go with dirt on this one. Okay. So, Terry, that leaves you with a choice of Heinz Ward, Jerome Bettis, or Franco Harris. So, I have a feeling I know where you're going with this one. Wow, you mean I can't double up? No, nope, we've got to pick one that's left. The I've got to pick one on that's you. left. Well, also, yeah, Star Wars. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Look at Kevin down there. He, he's, got, he's got that grin on his face. Bettis and Franco. i got to go with Franco then. I mean, it's, Franco. It's, uh, he just did so much for that team. And, uh, you know, Robert, I would have been with you if we could have, you know, doubled up on people. But uh, I've I got to go with Franco. All right. So that makes the Steelers' top five offenses voted tonight. Mike Webster, Terry Bradshaw, Damani Dawson, Ben Roethlisberger, and, of course, Franco Harris. So nice job, guys. Let's move into our Q&A tonight for uh, Terry. We're going to answer – he's going to answer some of our questions. Uh Brian, you, you were the, the man who got this guest for, so I appreciate that. So I'm going to let you ask first question. Okay. Well, I'm going to, Terry, I'm going to take you back to, uh, to your Notre Dame days. Um, you had, you had, uh, you had Rocky Blyer there with you where, um, you were under head coach, uh, uh, Parsegian. Can you describe what that was like, um, there in Notre Dame at South Bend? Well, it, it was, uh, probably the best four years of my life. You know, I made a decision when I was, what, 17 years old that it really affected my whole life, and that was to go. I was fortunate back then I could have gone to most places. and uh, uh, But I met Ara, and it was all over. I mean, he was the guy that, that I wanted to spend the next four years with. And and I really liked the, the thought at, at Notre Dame of, of playing a national schedule. You know, I didn't, want, I didn't want to be tied down to a Big Ten conference or but back then they had the SEC and the Pac-10 or whatever. Notre Dame plays, 
you know, all over the country. We played in Oklahoma, we played in California, we played in Florida, we played in Pittsburgh, we played, you know, we're all over. So that was the neat thing where you could get to travel like that. And, you know, the, the academics was wonderful. That's what you, you know, and there you really, really had to, I was called in a couple times, be a little tardy for classes and uh, you don't want to get to get called in too many times. But, you know, Rocky and I had, you know, Rocky was a year ahead of me and he was uh, our captain his senior year, my junior year. And Rocky was just the salt of the earth like he is today. I mean, he was, uh, you know, just a superhuman being. And uh, he, if you could, when he, when he came back from Vietnam, I mean, it was a story there that, in itself because he stayed with my family and I for a while and we'd work out together. And Mr. Rooney, Art Rooney, told him, he said, listen, Rocky, he says, if you want to go to law school, he said, I'm, I'm, I'm paying for everything. I'm paying for everything. Don't worry about it. You want to do that. And we'd work out together. And you could say, Rocky, you're just limping, limping, limping. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. How do you expect to play? How do you expect to even run? He said, I got to do it. I said, go to law school, man. Mr. Rooney said he's going to take care of you. No, no, I got to do it. I got to come back. I got to, you know, fight, fight back. And if you have, you could have bet the ranch back then, got any kind of odds that he would have rushed for a thousand yards at the NFL. I mean, it would have been unbelievable, but Rocky did it and he made a great career and it was, you know, a great, great story. But uh, no, we, we had a great time at Notre Dame then, you know, to be able to play together at uh, the Steelers, you know, under, you know, I liken it where I was very fortunate to play in a great family atmosphere in college with Notre Dame. And I came to the same kind of atmosphere with the Steelers, with the Rooney family. I mean, and we had we had such tightness in that locker room that it was really wonderful. They were all dear friends of mine, and they still are today. And it was just, uh, you know, I was very fortunate. I really was. So as I said before we started recording today, I grew up in Pittsburgh, but I live in Tampa now. So I wanted to ask you a question. Your final Hello. year... You played uh, for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which was their first season in, in existence. So just what was that like being part of an expansion team and trying to grow football in the in the Tampa area? Wow. It was uh, interesting because, you know, I saw the NFL like nobody saw it. In my rookie year with Pittsburgh, we were 1-13. Then two Super Bowls in my last year in the NFL were 0-14. So no one had the highs and lows like, like I had them. And it was it was really an interesting thing because it was an absolutely horrible football. You know, uh, Spurry was a quarterback. I went down, you yeah. know, and uh, got to know Steve. He's just a great guy. And I'll never forget we're coming up to to play the Steelers in, in Pittsburgh about halfway through the season. And McKay comes up to me and says, "You know, it'd be good for football to use for you to start against your old team." I said, who said that? <laughs> I go, oh, this is going to be sweet. But, uh, we went up there, and I'll, I won't tell you who said it, but we are sitting there, pregame meal, and it was one of my receivers that gave me one of the real, the real uh, confidence in the game. He said, I don't know why we're here. We should have just mailed in the score. I go, whoa, okay, here we go. But it was, I mean, I would – Drop back to pass and before the shotgun, obviously. I dropped back to pass. Joe would blow through the line, grab me, set me down. Next pass, go back. Elsie would come to the line, grab me, set me down. And Lambert, same way, come on, grab me, set me down. So at halftime, we didn't cross the 50. At halftime, we got in the locker room, okay, so I'm going to put Steve in, see if, he, see if he can't get something going. Okay, <laughs> have my blessing. We go out there and they beat the hell out of him the second the second half. And he comes off the field. He's limping. He looks at me and says, your boy, I still care you. <laughs> he's been limping <laughs> off the field. But it was interesting. Now, I knew that that was, I sort of solidified. I thought it would be cool to go down to an expansion team and, you know, maybe bring the knowledge I have and, and, and put it on to a young team like that. But, you know, you get tired of the game. I mean, that was my eighth year. And, you know, you're playing that thing since fourth grade. And back then you didn't make the money where these kids do today where they make generational money where you, you can't graciously retire back nowadays. You know, you're going to leave $30 million on the table. Right. You know, so so uh, I knew at that time I was 28. And I said, you know, you got to. 
find a new a new career. So that's what happened. Rollo, go ahead. So I've, I've the last couple of years I've seen a meme uh, that Terry Bradshaw was he he called his own plays. He called his own plays in the line of scrimmage. How accurate was that? And then when you started those four games in 73, did you have that same freedom? I, I called every play in 1969. Chuck Noll, we all did, steal a quarterback. You called your own plays. You know, Chuck gave you the freedom. That's the beauty of playing in Pittsburgh. You, you really got you, – you really – when someone else was going to call the plays – it's only second nature where you don't you don't study as hard. This way, when you know we put the game plan together, we you know we're in the room, me, Chuck, Joe Gilly, and Noel, and we put our game plan together. And so everybody knew what was in it, and we knew how to execute it. So you would call your own plays during the game. I mean, every once in a while he would send a play in, but it was rare, and you had the ability to to uh, to audible out of that. The only thing we had. The only thing we had um, was set with the first three plays of the game. Then, if, if, and if something happened that you didn't think was going, then you could audible out of that. But we called our own plays. I mean, it was, uh, and that was unheard of back then for the young guys, especially. You know, because I was considered old because I had one year under my belt when Terry came in. You know, so but we were all young, young kids. And uh, but uh, you you learn you learn the game plan fast. Kevin, go ahead. So I just um, – kind of like a two-parter. Um, so I just – what was it like to be drafted by your hometown team? And then uh, when Bradshaw came in and took over, uh, I know it was only like a year after you had started. Did the atmosphere change and whatnot? Because from what I heard, Bradshaw had kind of like a love-hate relationship with Pittsburgh, like the city itself. Was, is that an accurate thing with, with – to say about Bradshaw, like, did he not like Pittsburgh? Did he, did he like it Pittsburgh? Was, you know, it was, you know, if you don't do well, you're going to get booed, no matter who you are. That's, that's 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 nature of the beast. You know, these people come to a football game to release their all they all, they worked all long. They're paying money to watch a game, and sometimes them they they boo. So what are you going to do? I mean, that's that's part of the game. And a quarterback, as I've said it many a million times, gets too much abuse when they lose and gets too much credit when they win. So that's something you learn from grade school through high school through college. You know, you learn to cope with those things. And, you know, Terry has this thing about, you know, he had a problem with Chuck Noll. He says, and I'm going, wait a minute, I was in those same meetings. Now, there was no real problem with Chuck Noll. Chuck thought the world of Terry. And it was, Terry had, a, you know, the first couple of years was a real learning process. I remember we were playing the Giants all oh, preseason in Yankee Stadium in New York here. And I'll never forget because of pregame warm up, I went out there and I and I stood on home plate and went like this here. This is where the babe stood. Then I jumped over. I said, this is where Joe DiMaggio stood, you know, and went out to the stretch. And so we got in the game and and it was right before half the close game. It was right before halftime. Back then, you know, nowadays, you know, if you have two seconds on the clock, the offense is still going to try to score. You know, back then if you had a minute and a half and you just ran a clock out and went Halftime. So we had about a minute before half, and Chuck tells Terry, he says, we're going to run the clock out. Well, Terry goes in, first play, drops back, throws it down the middle, and the late great Spider Lockhart picks it off, runs it back for a touchdown. Whoa, Chuck's going crazy on the sideline, and Terry comes jogging off. And I step in between it and, you know, cushion the blow and everything like that. He said, no, go back in there, run the clock out. Now it's like 20 seconds, right? First play drops back, throws it down the middle, spider a lot harder, can't grab the ball, and they get a field goal out of it. He comes off the field. I said, nah, I did it once. I'm not doing it again. I just jogged off, and <laughs> and they were jawing at each other the whole way in. But, we, you know, he turned out, and I, and I said at the beginning, I said, he's, he's the most underrated quarterback ever. I think Terry should be in the top. You know, you never hear him when they say top five, top ten. You know, rarely do you see Terry's name in there. And I'm going, you, you, people are all missing something because he was a great quarterback. You know, it took him a little while to get started, but, you know, end result was great. You got time for one more each? Go for it. Uh, yeah. I get the same day, right? Do I get extra? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll give you a double. 
<laughs> Kevin, go ahead. You can go again. Go back to back. All right. Um, what was uh, some of the scariest uh, de- defenses you had to face in the NFL? Probably my rookie year. And the team was under or hadn't won a game. We were one. We we won our first game of the year. We were one and thirteen, but we beat Detroit at home. Then about halfway through the year, we go out to play Chicago at, in Wrigley Field, and that was something. We never crossed the fifty. First safety in my life, Dick Butkus tackled me in the end zone, mm-hmm. and I I got kicked out of me the whole game and. Fourth quarter, now they're up like 38 nothing. Fourth quarter, they're still safety blitzing me. And here you are, know, rookie. <laughs> and after the game, all the coaches, our coaching staff went for their coaching staff. You know, what are you doing this to a rookie quarterback? Blah, 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 blah. But Butkus was something. I mean, he was he was as intense as you'd ex- you know, everyone says. He you know, was a great one, there's no doubt. Rollo. <clears throat> the immaculate reception. I was right there. The I moment. know. Tell me what the locker room was like when you oh. guys ran into the locker room. What was the vibe? What was like? How was it? It was pandemonium, and the best was Mr. Rooney. He thought we lost because he was coming down the elevator. He, you know, he took his headset off or whatever and said the game's over. When we go down to the boys, because you could never really, when he came in the locker room, even when we were one and 13, you didn't know whether we won or lost. He was a great, great person. He really was. I, I loved playing for them. And he came down the locker room thinking we lost. And all these, everybody screaming and yelling. I mean, What's this all about? You know, <laughs> heck, where the heck when you lose? And no, no, we won, we won. And, Whoa, you know, he was, his eyes just lit up like that. But it was put $5,500 into everybody's pocket. Wow. <laughs> wow. Probably <laughs> poker tail. Okay, here's one. Let me throw one to you guys real quick. All right. My rookie year played six preseason games, right? Per game after tax. How much was my check? After tax? After tax. After tax spendable income. Preseason, three hundred bucks. 175 bucks. I'll go with 125. I'll say 250. 58 bucks. <laughs> wow. That was everybody. That was everybody. You got $58. You got 75 bucks a game. That's been more of that than that at Applebee's the other night. No green tore his up <laughs> one game. We're on the plane. Tore his up, threw the guys, you need it more than I do. We uh, you got you made fifty fifty eight dollar check. That's for love of the game there. <laughs> you mean you got to play six games? <laughs> yeah. Go, go ahead, Brian. <clears throat> so I mean, throughout the early part of your career, um, especially once Bradshaw got there, it was uh, a bit of a quarterback carousel uh, between you know yourself and Bradshaw and Gilliam. So could you talk about what that was like being part of that sort of quarterback controversy? Well, yeah, it was more controversy in the paper than it was. I remember <clears throat> they they picked, I forget which paper it was, Gazette or Press, I forget. They picked, pick your favorite quarterback. And they had the three of us listed. And uh, so that, that upset me. I didn't think the media should be doing something like that. So I think I, <clears throat> I inquired about how much it cost to take out an ad in the paper because I was I put in an ad, pick your favorite sports cat, sports writer. And I listed <laughs> to the guys, right? And I put other. And they said, well, it's going to be 250 bucks. Well, 250 bucks, you know, back then was huge, right? But That's Dan, your whole preseason. <laughs> yeah. Dan Rooney heard about it. And he called me up. He said, wait, that's a great idea. I said, Mr. Rooney, it costs 250 He said, I'll pay you. I'll pay you. I'll give you the check. Don't worry. So I go in there. <laughs> And I'm getting these all these right in, in these ballots, you know, this, that, this, that. Then I had to announce, and this is true, it was the three sports writers plus other. Linda Loveless won. Yeah. <laughs> Remember her? Throat. No way. <laughs> yeah. So we announced it. But, uh, no, I mean, we, you know, 
we, we helped each other. I mean, it was, there was no real controversy. I mean, we, you know, he get hurt. I go in, you know, Joe go in, you know, back and forth, you know, probably the thing Chuck should have done was trade us earlier would have helped everybody. I would have hated to leave because you make, you know, the ownership is so great and you made so many friends on the team, but you know, that would have probably been better for whoever he traded his career because you can't have three quarterbacks that close in age. That's just, you just, that's not getting enough reps, you know, so. Right. It was, the success was great, but, you know, you like to play a little more, but, you know, hey, that's life. Well, we'll get you out of here on this one. Um, so you, you held the Notre Dame passing touchdown record for over 30 years. Um, you know, what did it mean to you to have that record and then to be able to be there when it was broke by uh, Brady Quinn? Quinn, yeah. Well, no, it was, it was, you know, it, it was only a matter of time if it was going to get broken. I mean, there's no, I don't think there's any passing records anywhere. There's the live today, the way these kids throw the ball around. But it was, you know, it was special. And the thing, it's funny because my rookie, my first year, you know, you couldn't start as a freshman. You couldn't play the freshman because, you know, the freshman rule they had, you know, in allowed three years. And they wanted everybody to get used to the academics and being away from home because nobody traveled back then. And so, you know, we're starting – First game we played, I played against Purdue, Bob Greasy. They were ranked number four. We were ranked number two at the time. And the only question marks we had on the team were me and my receiver, Jim Seymour. You know, everybody else was – they put a lot of games under their belt. You know, we had a great offensive line, great running back, you know, defense, everything. And, you know, so we we threw – it was over 300 yards back then. And, you know, three touchdowns, no picks. And you know, I think I was like 26 out of – or 16 out of 24 for th over 300 yards and a couple of big ones. And I didn't know what that meant. You know, I didn't know that 300 yards was sort of the, a, anything above that's great, you know? Yeah. We, what we wanted, I've completed some passes. I had no clue, you know, so, but it was, it was uh, interesting times. I mean, we had a great, the sophomore year, we had a great team. We were national champions. And, you know, uh, we played Michigan State to the great 10-10 tie game. And I still say the two greatest teams ever to play each other were those Michigan State and Notre Dame, those two teams. The two, the people that came off those teams on both sides, the the, the Hall of Fames, the first-round picks, the, everything was just crazy. Hmm. Well, thank you, Terry Hanratty, for joining us tonight. Well, uh, thanks, guys. It was fun. Great to hear the old Steelers stories. That's awesome. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I want to uh, remind everyone to subscribe to the YouTube channel and join the Facebook group. Uh, we're trying to get that membership numbers up there. So uh, if you haven't subscribed and you're watching, just hit the subscribe button because we got a lot of people that watch. So hit that subscribe button. So thank you again, everyone, for watching. Thank you for joining us tonight and have a great evening. Okay. Take care, guys. Thank you, Terry. Right. Thank, Thank you. you.